going to focus more on the modeling and simulation side of things, um, but I would like to advertise to the experimentalist students in the audience um, to catch him afterward um, to ask about his instrumentation work. Uh, since John has a very well earned reputation for building some of the most beautiful and elegant hardware. Uh, so just as a teaser, I'll suggest that you ask him about how he designed and built a system to siphon off 1.5% of a giant thousand liter vat of liquid helium and keep it super fluid at an altitude of over 100,000 feet. Uh, so, uh, so with that bit of motivation, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, thanks so much for coming to speak to us today and we look forward to hearing your talk. I thought you were going to talk about something totally different, Cynthia, for that. <laughs> but anyways, uh, thank, thanks so much, Cynthia, for the for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, you all, for, for having me. Um, and thanks to my wife, who is downstairs uh, helping, uh, uh, keeping an eye on uh, the young boys who should be sleeping right now. Anyways, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, the stuff that I've been working on for the last couple of years, for most of my time, really. Uh, and that's sort of optical simulations and optical systematics in, in the context of CMB experiments. Um, and the image that you see here on the left is uh, uh, stolen from a paper by Michael Nemack that appeared in Applied Optics in 2018. Uh, and it's showing a bunch of ray trace diagrams for these cross Dragoni uh, optical systems. And um, these diagrams and this work uh, led by Michael Nemack uh, in some sense served as the, uh, the baseline for what eventually became the Simons of Surgery Large Aperture Telescope, this object here on the right, which is uh, currently being built um, in, in Duisburg in Germany and uh, should be deploying uh, in the near future to the Atacama Desert in Chile, where it will uh, start observing uh, the cosmic microwave background. So, so that's uh, you know the the stuff that uh, I'm working on, the cosmic microwave background, the oldest light in the universe. And I'm going to try to sort of before after I've maybe done uh, spent a few minutes on, on, on an introduction to this uh, overall science theme. Uh, I'll talk about optical systematics and optical uh, simulations. Um, okay, so. Uh, so the cosmic microwave background, this, this oldest light in the universe, is something that we've been studying for uh, almost 60 years now. Uh, and there are three uh, famous satellite experiments, COBE, W, Map, and Planck, uh, that have, in some sense, led that effort. Uh, and uh, we have uh, images from these satellites. Uh, this is part of the COBE full sky map and W, Map, and Planck. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've put uh, sort of sprinkled uh, around this image some uh, key science uh, achievements that uh, and stuff that we learned about the universe uh, from studying this this microwave background or CMB for short. OK, so uh, why do we study uh, the cosmic microwave background um, uh, and why do we study the millimeter uh, sky? Well, we have this model uh, of the universe that we refer to as Lambda CDM, uh, a model that where the energy density of the universe is dominated by dark matter and, and dark energy. Um, and it's been incredibly successful uh, in explaining the large scale uh, universe. Um, but there are quite a lot of caveats um, in, in that model and, and, and things that we, we want to learn more about. For example, what actually is dark matter? What is dark energy? We want to know uh, about uh, and figure out what are uh, the reasons for uh, mild departure or mild uh, tensions in, in this model of the uh, universe. And uh, you know, by continuing to map the millimeter wavelength sky, we can learn uh, about some of the, uh, possibly some of the earliest moments in the history of the universe, learn about neutrinos, learn about dark matter, learn about dark energy and reionization, et cetera. If you're not interested in cosmology, you can you can still uh, learn uh, some interesting things by by mapping the millimeter wavelength sky. Uh, maybe my favorite uh, that I learned about recently is the fact that uh, you might be able to uh, detect uh, this uh, hypothes hypothesized planet nine, uh, a dim object that might be lurking somewhere outside the trajectory of, of Neptune. Uh, Okay, so there's lots of things that we can learn by, by studying uh, this uh, uh, part of the uh, spectrum of light. So um, I mentioned the Planck satellite. So 
this collage uh, is showing uh, six of the frequency bands within, or maps of six of the frequency bands on the Planck satellite. Uh, so this is three millimeter wavelength, this is one millimeter wavelength, and this is roughly 300 microns. Uh, and it shows you that um, the cosmic microwave background, the stuff that uh, I'm going to be talking about for the majority of this talk, uh, is most pronounced uh, at these frequencies. And then as you go to higher frequencies, you, you start to see uh, more of just the, the galaxy. And you can make an argument that uh, the Planck satellite has uh, sort of extracted almost all of the information in the temperature anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. So, um, uh, you can draw this cartoon uh, of the history of the universe. Um, uh, Big Bang, where we start our stopwatches, followed by uh, some kind of early universe scenario, whether it's something within the cosmic inflationary paradigm or, or something uh, uh, different from that. And then uh, after this early universe scenario, uh, you can argue that sort of uh, the events that follow are, are well described uh, by um, general relativity, a standard model of particle physics and statistical uh, mechanics in some sense. The, the cosmic micro background, this uh, image over here is emitted roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, according to our standard model of cosmology. And um, you, know, you can learn about events that happened before the CMB was emitted because these events uh, uh, leave an imprint in the statistical properties of the CMB. But uh, you can actually also learn stuff about events that happened uh, later, because this uh, radiation serves as a backlight to, to those later events. And uh, arguably, uh, many of the, the upcoming uh, uh, well, major science goals of, of future CMB experiments have to do with the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. Um, uh, for example, uh, number one on my list, the search for primordial gravitational waves. Um, let me just uh, tell you very briefly what, what that implies. So uh, some models that describe uh, early universe uh, events, uh, for example, models within the cosmic inflationary paradigm, they predict that we'll have gravitational waves, high energy gravitational waves that interact with this primordial plasma and leave a, a polarized pattern in the cosmic microwave background, uh, a special swirly pattern that we refer to as B-mode uh, polarization. OK, so uh, let's step back, though, uh, for, for a little bit and um, talk, what, talk about the cosmic microwave background. So I said that we've been studying this for, for almost 60 years now. Uh, and this image here in the background is actually uh, data uh, from the Planck satellite. And uh, if you uh, uh, were able to see the cosmic microwave background, it would look like a relatively uniform black body radiation. Basically, no matter what direction you'd look into, you'd see roughly the same intensity signal. Uh, and this is the equation that describes the spectral radiance uh, written by Max Planck some hundred years ago. And this is a plot that Jim Peoples made in 1965, uh, uh, where he took this function and fit it to two data points, one from uh, Pentius Wilson uh, and one from uh, an experiment uh, that was conducted at Princeton. And uh, he arrived at the conclusion that the universe is permeated by a three Kelvin black body radiation. And now we know that the more accurate number is maybe 2.72 Kelvin or something like that. Um, okay, so when we subtract the, 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 this constant signal, we're left with the, the so-called CMB anisotropies. So these statistical variations on the sky, uh, hot and cold spots. And the thing to keep in mind is that the, um, the scale uh, here now is a factor of 10,000 times smaller than the scale in this image here. So these are relatively tiny uh, variations. And like I suggested, it turns out that the CMB is actually partially polarized. Uh, and uh, the reason for that has to do with, with these quadrupolar anisotropies. And uh, we actually decompose this polarization vector field on the sky, effectively using these uh, E mode and B mode uh, polarization patterns. And uh, uh, the B mode patterns that I was uh, uh, referring to uh, a few minutes ago uh, uh, look like these, you know, these are uh, odd under parity. So if I mirror this pattern here, it becomes this pattern here, whereas these are. Uh, even under parity. 
Okay, so uh, we can also use Stokes uh, parameters to describe uh, linear polarization. So Stokes I is just the intensity, uh, the temperature, so to speak, and Stokes Q and U are, are the uh, linear polarization components. And again, these are data. Uh, and you can see that I went with a, a red, white, and blue theme for these plots. Um, so these are data. And um, uh, the reason you see these artifacts here is because um, Stokes Q and Stokes U are uh, even dimmer or less, uh, well, it's only partially polarized. So this, this color scale here is much lower than this color scale here. And so it's difficult for us to actually distinguish between uh, the C and B, something that's coming from the last scattering surface uh, and uh, our, our own galaxy that we live in. And so that's the reason we have these artifacts in our best estimates for the C and B polarization. And these are again, data from, from the Planck satellite. Okay, so then uh, finally, um, uh, just uh, a refresher for, for some of y'all. Uh, that we describe uh, these anisotropies, these maps, we basically decompose them using these spherical harmonic functions uh, that look like this. And as you go up in multiple, uh, so L here is the parameter that I refer to as multiple, you're basically seeing more variations on the, on the sky. So it's increasing the, the angular, uh, uh, well, angular frequency, so to speak. So if you push up in L, you're going to smaller and smaller angular scales. So uh, this is what we refer to as angular power spectrum, which is basically uh, the, the, uh, the squared value of the, uh, these uh, coefficients that we use to, to describe the sky. Okay, and then um, finally, uh, so it turns out that uh, the initial perturbations that we have in our cosmological models can be decomposed into scalar modes and tensor modes. And it's getting a little bit technical, but basically scalar modes can be thought of as uh, sound waves that are interacting with the primordial plasma and tensor modes can be thought of as gravitational waves. And um, uh, and, I, and I got this picture from uh, Alte Daufenvorten, who uh, I will mention again in a later part in this talk. So we've detected scalar modes. Uh, we've detected, obviously, the temperature anisotropies and the E-modes uh, polarization. But we've yet to actually detect uh, tensor modes. So uh, basically, we've yet to detect a gravitational waves uh, in, in the uh, CMB anisotropies. And so we only have upper limits on the amplitude of any potential uh, gravitational waves that are interacting uh, with the primordial plasma or propagating through the primordial plasma. So uh, all these uh, curves here that you see are, are theoretical curves. Um, okay. So um, another thing that is maybe worth uh, uh, keeping in mind when we think about CMB experiments is that um, uh, there's a lot of data compression so what do I mean by that? So this is uh, the same image that I showed a few minutes ago, uh, the sum of the uh, Planck full sky maps. And um, the compression that I'm referring to is the fact that uh, for, in the case of Planck, at least, you have maybe a of order two terabytes of, of, of raw data that you compress into these 50 megapixel images. And then you reduce those images into these angular power spectra and then eventually you fit uh, a six parameter vanilla uh, uh, Lambda CDM model. And so there's a whole lot of uh, data processing that's happening until you reach uh, you know, your final goal of being able to uh, constrain uh, standard model of cosmology and maybe some extensions to it. So um, there's a lot of work that's happening behind the scenes. Okay, so <laughs> I have to apologize for this slide because it, it's, a, it's sort of a last minute thing. I was trying to uh, bring up uh, all of the sort of current and, and, and uh, future upcoming CMB experiments. And I'm absolutely sure that, I've, that I missed a few. Um, just to uh, point out some, um, well, let's go over them. Uh, so the South Pole Telescope, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, uh, Simon's Array and CLASS are all uh, current ground-based experiments. Spider balloon born experiment, uh, which uh, Cynthia mentioned, uh, is also current in the sense that uh, we're hoping to deploy it again next year. We had plans to deploy this balloon born experiment uh, this December, but uh, because of COVID, that didn't work out. Obviously, we have the BICEP and Keck collaboration uh, with uh, these telescopes at the South Pole. Uh, 
an upcoming experiment is called Simon Subsurgery. Uh, I showed this image before. And then uh, uh, representing Europe, we have something called LSPE, which is a, a very interesting balloon borne experiment. Um, and uh, then further in the future, we hopefully have Lightbird deploying in maybe 10 years from now, uh, a fourth generation CMB satellite and uh, CMB S4. So, uh, so that's sort of a, a very brief survey of the field. And I apologize, I'm definitely missing some experiments. So what are the challenges of these uh, future experiments? Uh, so number one, uh, uh, and by far the biggest challenge of these future CMB experiments are, are galactic foregrounds. Uh, so like I said, uh, you know, we live in a galaxy, this is a galactic plane. Uh, and this is a, an image that was uh, released by the Planck collaboration five years ago. And these uh, contours that you see here are tracing uh, 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 galactic field lines. And uh, we have dust in our galaxy, microscopic silicon and carbon particles that uh, are not spherically symmetric. They will uh, align their magnetic dipole moments with uh, these magnetic field lines and they will emit uh, polarized light. The temperature of this dust is maybe roughly 20 Kelvin. And um, you know this polarization that's emitted by, by uh, these dust particles does not care about whether it's producing E-mode polarization or B-mode polarization uh, to, to, to a good approximation. Uh, and so uh, this serves as a foreground to our uh, search for primordial gravitational waves for these swirly patterns that come from the cosmic micro background. Uh, we see uh, this type of polarization also from, from dust. And um, I have to apologize for this image here. Uh, I have three uh, topics that are sort of the key challenges of future uh, CMP experiments. And I was going to make a, a nice version of this picture, but uh, I ran out of time. So I stole this from uh, 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 an old Planck paper. So this is, uh, I guess, a half mission difference map, in some sense, uh, giving you a sense of the, the noise per pixel in a, in a Planck data product at 100 gigahertz. Um, so I apologize. And I also apologize for this picture here. I was gonna make a very nice version of this picture, uh, but I ran out of time. So this is uh, in some sense, um, a full sky. Uh, you could uh, try to imagine that this is like, a, uh, well, this is uh, 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 from minus 100, uh, degrees to plus 100 de degrees, and this is from zero degrees to 180 degrees. This is supposed to be like a full sky B map. Um, and this is based on a simulation of the Planck satellite at uh, 100 gigahertz, uh, at the optical response. Um, so I'll talk about beams in, in a few minutes. Um, okay, so, so there are all sorts of systematics uh, that we can think of uh, in the context of CMB experiments. And a big class of those systematics uh, relate to the optical system. Um, okay, so uh, in black and white, the requirements for future CMB instruments is the fact that we need frequency coverage. We need to understand uh, what uh, in our data is coming from the galaxy, uh, for example, what's coming from uh, dust. Uh, and what is actually the cosmic microwave background. And you can learn about that. You can figure that out by deploying as many frequency bands as possible. Uh, you also need optical throughput. Um, so that's sort of a, just a fancy way of saying that we are noise dominated. And that's for some, you know, in some sense, the reason why we're deploying so many telescopes uh, and the reason why Simon's Observatory is deploying three small aperture telescopes uh, is because we really just need to push down our noise limits. And then finally, uh, we need to uh, control uh, various systematic effects. So these are the three things that you know, we should be worried about in the context of, of uh, CMB experiments. And I won't talk really about number one here, but I'll touch briefly on two, and then I'll focus for the rest of my talk on, on optical systematics. So uh, talking about optical throughput, um, I took this image from uh, uh, the Planck 2018 results. And if you zoom in on the, uh, so this is the, the uh, E-mode angular power spectrum. Uh, and this blue curve here is the one sigma error bar on the data points from the measurements from Planck. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the limit that you would have from uh, just the fact that there is a limited number of uh, multiples that are available or, or independent modes that are available to us 
is this cosmic variance limit here. And so in theory, we should be able to push this blue curve down by roughly a factor of two. And so, uh, you know, the Planck satellite is limited by, by noise uh, in various uh, multiple ranges, and so are other uh, uh, ground-based experiments. So, uh, you know, the way you, you beat down noise is, uh, is by increasing optical throughput. Uh, at least that's one way to, to get at that. And um, if you're a radio astronomer, I, I imagine you've heard about this concept. Uh, it's effectively this uh, product of the, the effective area of your telescope and the field of view of your telescope. Uh, and um, what this uh, tells you is that it gives you the number of independent radiation modes that are propagating uh, through the system. So, um, you know, this is uh, an image from NIST showing one of the uh, bolometers that are being developed there for future CMP experiments. And, uh, you know, these detectors, these bolometers, this is a cartoon picture of one of those bolometers. Uh, most of the light that the detectors are, are, are sensing actually come from the atmosphere and from emission from the instrument. Only a tiny fraction of the uh, signal or the, the light that uh, is incident on detectors actually comes from the CMB. And you also have thermal oscillations, all sorts of other noise components that are dominating uh, uh, the power uh, that is detected by the spolometer. So um, just to emphasize the point that we're uh, limited by uh, 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 these noise components. Um, so the way to push down on the noise is by integrating. So the map depth, the, essentially the noise in our maps scales with the number of detectors uh, and it scales with the square root of the integration time as you would expect. Okay, so uh, and finally control of systematic effects. So basically as we push down our, our noise floor, as we deploy more telescopes on the sky and uh, more pixels, uh, eventually, uh, more and more of uh, the non-idealities in our instrument start to peak up from the noise floor. Uh, and so uh, the importance of understanding those non-idealities gets larger and larger as our noise floor gets pushed down. So, uh, and, um, you know, uh, non-idealities in our instruments can be of various type. You can have uh, uh, electric problems or thermal issues uh, and all sorts of uh, different ways in which you can create non-ideal uh, uh, response in your in your time stream. Uh, and, a, and a large class of those uh, systematics uh, relates to the optical system. So that's really what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. And uh, you know, optical systematics is not something that we just see in CMB experiments. Uh, you worry about it when you're deploying uh, uh, radio telescopes to search for a uh, 21 centimeter monopole signal. You worry about it when you're deploying uh, the Event Horizon Telescope. You worry about it uh, when you are thinking about optical or near infrared astronomy and cosmology. This is the secondary on the LSST, um, or uh, uh, I guess it's now called uh, the Rupin Observatory. If I'm not mistaken. And you even worry about spatial response when you're thinking about um, the upcoming uh, LISA uh, gravitational wave uh, satellite experiment. This is an image that I stole from a colleague, uh, Carlo Contaldi, uh, a recent paper that he, that he published with uh, some colleagues. Okay, so um, uh, constraints on tensor to scalar ratio. Uh, it's a bit uh, of a technical term. I haven't really talked about it before, but um, uh, the amplitude of primordial gravitation waves is effectively described by this parameter R, which we refer to as a tensor to scalar ratio. Um, and so uh, the lower the limits on R are the, the lower the, uh, the signal of the uh, beam of polarization that we're searching for. Okay, so we've been actually trying to push down limits on R for quite some time. And uh, 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 maybe one of the sort of uh, groundbreaking experiments in this field and, and, and publications were led uh, by Professor uh, Chang et al., uh, which was, I guess, made public in 2009. Uh, we have uh, experiments like QUIET that were also working on this and uh, experiments that sort of uh, uh, pushed uh, uh, from BICEP1 to so BICEP2 and the Keck array, Keck array over here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm probably forgetting uh, uh, 
some uh, key limits that have been published in recent years. But basically, you can see that we're gradually pushing down uh, the limits uh, on this tension to scalar ratio. For, for a while, we thought we had a detection, but that uh, turned out to be dust. Right. So um, most recently, we had a, a paper by Matthew Tristram et al. that actually used uh, data from the Planck satellite. Um, and so uh, eventually, we're going to have to change this scale to a log scale and go to uh, even uh, lower values, hopefully. OK. And I apologize. I'm, I'm sure that I'm forgetting some, some publications that, that push down uh, or publish constraints on, on R. So um, you know, we've also been, um, as the limits on R goes down, the number of detectors on the sky has been going up. Uh, so we're trying to increase our optical throughput. We're uh, trying to push the noise floor down. So this is actually on a log scale. And um, I think it's uh, uh, appropriate to say that right now, uh, I guess uh, with the uh, caveat of uh, you know, how well we're gonna be able to observe this guy in, in, uh, in this season because of COVID, uh, we have maybe 10,000 detectors on the sky, and it's fair to assume that in maybe three years from now, we'll have somewhere between 50 and 100,000 detectors on the sky. So this field is pushing for more and more optical throughput. Uh, and I apologize to colleagues uh, on Simon's Array and Polar Bear and class. I just did not have time to compile the numbers to fill uh, uh, the, these histograms with, with those detectors. Um, okay. So yeah, and this is this is only the detectors that are uh, at observing at 90 and 150 gigahertz. Uh, so uh, one uh, three millimeters and two millimeters uh, wavelength. Okay, so um, just to step back uh, briefly. Um, so this I showed part of this image, or this is a part of an image that I showed before. The the uh, data from uh, Planck satellite that's showing the magnetic field lines in our in our in our galaxy. And uh, this is data from uh, BISA2 uh, Keck collaboration. And you can see these Rolly patterns here and these uh, B-mode uh, patterns on the sky. Uh, and, and just this is what we're, we're looking after. And uh, you know, it turns out that, or it turned out that uh, this image can be uh, shown to be completely consistent with emission from dust in our own galaxy. So the, 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 uh, so we're continuing uh, this effort. Okay, so another uh, thing that came out of uh, that uh, publication uh, five years ago, uh, apart from the angular power spectra that you see here, uh, are these uh, systematic residuals. Um, and so what you're looking at here, especially in this panel over here, uh, are basically uh, the predictions of that uh, experiment or that collaboration for the impact of various instrument non-idealities. And in this case, in this particular panel, it's only uh, optical non-idealities on the uh, angular power spectrum. So the B mode uh, power spectrum, COLBB, right? And one thing to uh, notice is that uh, without any correction to their data analysis, uh, the, uh, that instrument effect will actually be larger than uh, the, uh, their best fit model for the sum of uh, 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 B modes uh, and uh, lensing B modes. So in, even uh, five years ago, we needed to uh, start correcting uh, our data for instrument dependent optical effects. So, um, so that, that's going to continue and get more uh, more challenging as, as, as we get more sensitive uh, maps. So um, Cynthia reminded me of, of this uh, visualization of the challenge that uh, upcoming CMB experiments are facing. So um, uh, this is a simulated map uh, of the Stokes eye, so the temperature and isotropies. So this is consistent with Lambda CDM cosmology. Uh, and so this is just the temperature. If you want to try to visualize the polarization, you can try to use these uh, quiver plots. So these uh, uh, vectors that you see here uh, sprinkled uh, across the map are supposed to uh, highlight the uh, orientation of the polarization and the amplitude. The length of the vectors correspond to the amplitude. 
And um, this simulation uh, and these vectors that you see here are consistent with uh, vanilla lambda CDM, where there is no primordial beam mode polarization. And now if we push uh, the, the, it, uh, the amount of primordial beam modes so that the tensor to scalar ratio is 0 0.05, you get this image. And if I cycle back and forth between these two images, uh, I, I doubt that you see much difference. Um, so that's sort of a, um, a visualization that's trying to emphasize the fact that the signal that we're after is quite, quite small. Okay, so now um, let me uh, start talking about optics, <laughs> really the main uh, focus on my talk. So um, when you're talking about uh, telescopes and optical simulations, you're sort of always talking about diffraction effects. And I just thought these were beautiful images of, of uh, diffraction in nature. Uh, so I decided to start very easy by showing these pictures. Uh, and you can actually um, you know, remind yourself of the single slit diffraction experiment that many of you did in introductory lab courses in physics, where you shown a lyser uh, through a single slit and you looked at the area pattern that you got, right? And if you have a plane wave coming in uh, uh, perpendicular to this aperture, you get a nice area pattern that's described by this equation here. Uh, if that plane wave comes in at an angle, you get a slightly different area pattern. It's skewed or uh, well, it's shifted from the symmetry axis, but it turns out that it's no longer symmetric around uh, the, the peak, right? Uh, because the projection effects, uh, you know, the, this aperture looks slightly different depending on whether you're over here or over here. So that uh, is sort of a, a simple way to uh, 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 or an ad analogy to the issues that we have when we're deploying uh, CMB experiments, uh, our beams start to become elliptical when we go off axis. So a more realistic uh, image, uh, and now instead of showing plane waves, I'm actually showing ray tracing diagrams. And the way to think about it is that, you know, the rays are always perpendicular to the plane wave. So, you know, it's the same scenario for a simple uh, CMB uh, uh, telescope, you, for example, this telescope here, which is uh, made out of two silicon lenses, um, you get area patterns. They're just more complicated. They're not described by that by that nice analytical expression. Uh, and it turns out that uh, a pixel over here, this detector that I'm trying to uh, draw, actually gets a little bit of photons from uh, this location here on the sky, the, the, the plane web that's coming perpendicular to the aperture. If you just extend this area pattern out to the center pixel, you can imagine that uh, there's at least some non-negligible sensitivity to uh, uh, light that's coming in at that angle. So when we're uh, making B maps uh, for CMP experiments, we're, we're just trying to write a function B of theta and phi, where theta and phi are just the, the angular coordinates on the sky. Uh, and they look something like this when you run simulations. Okay, so when, when we're designing a telescope um, for CMB experiment, um, there's a lot of uh, decisions that, are, that, that, that we make, right? And I was sort of uh, in that first slide that I show you the front page of for my talk, there's a very complicated decision tree from you know, going from those ray trace diagrams all the way down to a, a final uh, set in stone design that's being constructed. And um, if you're thinking about uh, experiments that are uh, aimed at mapping polarization on degree scales, focusing on primordial beam mode polarization, you could ask questions like, should I build a refractor telescope? So using lenses, or should I build a reflector telescope like the cross Dragoni uh, design that is used on the large aperture telescope? Uh, and um, as far as I can tell from, from the, the various collaborations that I'm uh, currently working uh, on, there's not a good answer for which one is better for mapping uh, primordial beam modes. So should you choose a refractor telescope or a reflector? Should you use silicon lenses or plastic lenses? What's your edge taper? Should you use a polarization modulator, et cetera, et cetera. All these questions and the answers to them impact our ability to map the uh, beam mode polarization. So I've been talking for, for 35 minutes and uh, uh, it was suggested that maybe I would pause and, and ask if there were questions, um, are there any questions? So we don't have any questions on the chat right now, but if anyone has one and would like to raise their hand, um, we could just call on you. So maybe we can pause for a second. 
<clears throat> Sounds good. Um, All right, let's go ahead. I'll just co continue. Thanks. So I talk about some of these decision and design choices in, in paper that uh, was recently published in Applied Optics. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we're doing uh, in, in upcoming ground-based experiments in particular is that we're pushing uh, the, in some sense, the field of view to larger and larger angles. We're trying to, you know, have our mappers uh, catch uh, a as, as big portion of the sky in, in one uh, exposure, so to speak. And um, so that's, that's, you know, that actually comes with a lot of uh, technical challenges. And the further you push away from the symmetry axis of your telescope, the more likely it is that you'll have uh, optical systematic effects. Okay, so you can model these telescopes uh, using all sorts of uh, techniques. Um, and the, the one that most of us uh, uh, are, well, people are most likely to have seen uh, are these ray tracing diagrams. So with simple ray tracing tools, you can learn about basic properties of a telescope, such as the F number and the Strel ratio, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, a relatively computationally inexpensive way to uh, learn about your, your design. But uh, one of the issues with, with ray tracing uh, is that it doesn't account for the wave-like nature of light. Diffraction is not included in this way of, of simulating the telescope. So if you want to worry about diffraction effects, uh, and that's something, for example, that you need to think about if you want to predict what your far field beam response looks like, you need to do something else. So uh, another technique uh, that is quite common is referred to as physical optics. So in this case, you, um, you're essentially launching, well, uh, if you think about it in a time reverse sense, which is, uh, uh, which is valid as long as uh, energy is conserved, you can uh, launch an electric field from your pixel. Uh, uh, so uh, radiation is going from right to left in this diagram. And that, uh, that electric field, that pointing vector, so to speak, will interact with your secondary lens. So this, is, this uh, transition here is showing the sky side of the secondary lens. Uh, and so the electric field will, will interact with the lens and you'll have surface currents uh, that uh, will then make it possible for you to calculate the, the field uh, on the sky side of that lens. So this image here, this uh, this very uniform blob is just the field that is radiated by that secondary lens. Uh, and that interacts with the primary lens. And again, you can calculate the surface currents uh, on these lenses or that lens. And uh, this allows you to uh, basically calculate uh, the power uh, on, you know, that is uh, transferred to the sky. And it's from, from simulations like this that you can actually calculate the far field beam response of your telescope. Okay, and so just to uh, uh, <laughs> give you an idea of what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. So this is, I'm showing the ray trace diagram here on, on top of the, the physical optics simulation. So this uh, way of, of uh, calculating and or modeling our optical response um, is slightly more computationally intensive. So now you need to mesh up, you need to in some sense pixelize uh, these lenses, and uh, you need to do sub wavelength pixelization in order to have accurate results. And so uh, this can actually get very computationally expensive if you if you're working with large uh, electrically large objects. Um, this is quite uh, manageable in the case of, of small aperture telescopes like a, this 40 centimeter diameter lens. Um, okay, so one of the issues with this physical optics approach is that it's sequential in the sense that if I go back, uh, I start here and I say, I want to interact with the secondary lens. And then I tell the secondary lens to interact with the primary lens and then uh, uh, out to the sky. So I have to actually describe the interaction uh, tree in some sense of my simulation. And uh, obviously these lenses are not floating in free space. They're supported by structures. Uh, and we want to try to account for those. Um, we also want to try to account for things like uh, internal reflections in the lenses and radiation uh, bouncing back and forth between the lenses. So in that case, the, we can actually do something that is referred to as full wave solutions, uh, or um, oftentimes it's, it's a type of full wave solution called method of moments. 
and uh, in this case, you're actually, in some sense, uh, solving the entire system in one go. So now I, I have a source and that, that source illuminates this system, which is composed of these two lenses. And uh, basically that uh, simulation will account for all internal reflections and back reactions, et cetera. Uh, but this, this becomes very computationally expensive and, uh, and memory intensive. Okay. Um, the difference between these two simulations is the fact that, um, you know, uh, silicon, for example, has an uh, index of refraction of 3.5 or 3.4. So it's, uh, it's actually quite reflective. Um, and I guess I'm quoting that index in, in the millimeter wavelength range. Um, so uh, it's reflective. So that means that you need to worry about, uh, you know, you want to try to minimize reflection. So you want to deploy anti-reflection coatings on your lenses. So uh, the difference between those, these two pictures are just showing uh, uh, what happens if you forget to apply anti-reflection coating on your lenses, right? And this is something that you can't actually account for with physical optics, uh, at least not easily. Uh, and like I said, the, the lenses are not floating in, in free space. They're actually supported by a telescope structure and there are uh, walls and cylinder, you know, cylinder walls and dielectric absorbers and all sorts of interesting components. And you would like to try to account for all of them in your simulations. And so the only way to really do that in a way that is sort of complete and accounts for various reflections in a, in a, in a nice way is by using these full wave solutions. So this is a simulation that is sort of somewhat representative of uh, the uh, optics tube in the Simon's Research Large Aperture Telescope. So these, these objects that you see here are, are, are absorbers. Okay. Um, so, and then you have stuff like filters. Um, you know, you're not just having lenses in this telescope, you're trying to uh, prevent thermal radiation that is out of band. And these filters will actually, uh, you know, we always treat them as just uh, perfect objects that, that uh, 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 transmit the radiation that we want and reflect the radiation that we don't want. But it turns out that that actually is, uh, is not, that's only a, a, an approximation. And uh, you can run simulations uh, using uh, HFSS or various commercial softwares to try to uh, understand how these filters uh, impact uh, the uh, signal that's going through your telescope. And um, I think I'll, I'll skip this just in the interest of time. Uh, so, but you know, just very briefly though. So this is the transmission spectrum of a, of a filter that is typically used in CMB experiments. So, uh, you know, it allows low frequencies to pass through and then it cuts high frequencies. Uh, and you can do simulations. And it turns out that around the cutoff frequency, uh, you have diffraction effects. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, I'm, I'm illuminating a, a source of so my sources here on the right, and it's going from right to left and it's going through the filter. And if it's sufficiently low frequency, it'll just go straight through. But then when it reaches uh, near the cutoff frequency, you'll start to get very interesting diffraction patterns. And these lobes that you see here will actually, they're not, uh, they don't go away. They, they will bounce around in your, in your telescope. And that's something that we need to, to worry about. Uh, this is what you would see if there were no filter. Um, okay. So um, one thing that we've been doing, uh, well, so, so you know, at Stockholm University, we've been working on these various ways in which we can simulate our optical response of future CMP experiments. Um, the other side of that coin, in some sense, is to uh, take the output of our beam models, these uh, B of theta phi, and scan the sky with the beam models. So uh, this is uh, an image of the sky, and this is uh, supposed to be a visualization of a symmetric Gaussian beam. And when you scan the sky with a symmetric Gaussian beam, you get uh, an isotropic, well, you get a, a a signal that does not depend on the scan strategy. If you try to scan the sky with an elliptical a beam that breaks symmetry, the signal that you get uh, in your time stream actually starts to depend on the scan strategy, the angle that you're coming in. So depending on the whether the orientation of your beam is like this or like this, the signal will be slightly different. So um, uh, you know when you're scanning the sky, you're effectively convolving the sky with your beam. So this. Uh, this thing here is the sky and this is the beam and you're doing a convolution. 
Um, and uh, a trick that we learned in Fourier analysis is the fact that uh, convolution in real space is a multiplication in Fourier space. And we actually uh, make use of that trick in simulating um, the, the signals that are generated by, by experiments. So um, uh, a Stockholm University PhD student, Adri Taufenfoden, uh, who's now a postdoc at uh, Princeton University uh, working on uh, ACT and the Simons of Surgery, he wrote uh, this public uh, uh, open source code that we call BeamConf. And so basically what we're doing here is we take the, the models that we generate in our optical simulations and we take models that describe the CMB and models that describe the dust and uh, assumptions about some scan strategy and we scan the sky uh, uh, and we generate a signal time stream using these uh, you know, uh, uh, relatively complicated uh, analytical expressions that uh, Adri developed. And um, you know, we essentially create signal time streams that we then uh, map and turn into power spectra. And we look at the impact of various optical non-idealities on our ability to constrain uh, primordial beam polarization. So, you know, Adi was not the first person to, to do this. There, there are papers, you know, that, um, uh, that predate uh, uh, this publication that uh, was released in 2018. But Adri is the first person to write a code that is uh, open source, as far as we know, or was the first person. Um, and, um, um, you know, this is written in, in Python uh, primarily. And in the first paper that uh, we wrote as part of this, this exercise, it, basically, we simulated a, a, a fake uh, CMP satellite experiment. Uh, very proud of this image over here. Uh, that scanned the sky with a simple refractor telescope. Uh, and we simulated one year of scanning at, uh, uh, I think, I think we had 200 detectors sampling at 100 hertz and scanning the sky for one year. And um, we looked at uh, different optical non-idealities and tried to predict what they would do to our final B mode power spectrum. Um, okay, so we got images look, uh, that look like this. Uh, and if I focus on the images for a little bit, um, this image here came out of, so basically what you're looking at here is the uh, uh, Stokes Q or Stokes U, it doesn't really matter, uh, residual map. So basically we take an ideal optical system uh, and we scan the sky, our input model. And then we take our non-ideal uh, optical model and we scan the sky with it. And then we difference the result of those two uh, simulations. And we get something that looks like this. And so this is Stokes Q polarization. And then once we have these difference maps, we can calculate the angular power spectra and we can make residual B modes plots like the one that you see here. Uh, and you know, uh, some of the sign goals, uh, well, we had a lot, um, science goals, sorry. Some of the results from, from that work uh, told us, for example, that the assumption of a simple elliptical Gaussian beam, which is sort of the first order uh, extension to the simple Gaussian beam model is not enough. Um, basically it's, it does, it's incorrect. It, it's not sufficient in order to explain some of these residuals. So what do I mean by that? So basically uh, these elliptical Gaussian beam models, these dashed curves over here at 90, 150 gigahertz, they will create residual uh, spectra that look like this. And I'm showing uh, 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 different tensor to scalar ratios. Uh, if I, or if we account for the full output of our uh, beam model and scan the sky with, with that model, we get these residual curves, which are order of magnitude greater uh, than the elliptical Gaussian approximation. So that's uh, sort of just um, uh, an interesting data point. Another thing, and maybe more importantly, is the fact that um, you know our beams are not described by elliptical Gaussians. They're not described by compact physical optics uh, beams that you know that uh, lose uh, power outside of uh, maybe a few degrees. They actually extend the entire uh, full extent of the sky. So we have these side lobes in our in our beam models. And uh, uh, using a relatively uh, conservative side lobe model, when you scan the sky, you uh, will couple to the galaxy. So you can simulate an input map, which is composed of just the CMB, or you can simulate uh, a, CMB, a map of the input sky, which is composed of CMB plus dust. 
And so here, what we're doing is that we're you're scanning the sky that has uh, both CMB and dust in it, and we're masking uh, in our analysis 40% of the you know this, this, the galactic plane, and we can see that there are uh, basically the side lobes will uh, grab power from the uh, galaxy and put it into regions on the sky that we think are clean, uh, and so these side lobes will create. Uh, residuals that are actually comparable to some of the, uh, well, the tensor to scalar ratio that is uh, uh, sort of a science goal for future CMB experiments. So, you know, in the future, we're going to have to understand our side models quite uh, well in order to uh, correct for uh, these effects. Okay, so I felt when I was writing this talk that it really needed a flow diagram. So um, I made this uh, flow diagram, and really, the you know I'm trying to uh, talk about sort of um, our overall uh, goal here at Salco University, which is that um, which is sort of an ambitious goal. But basically, you work on uh, designing a telescope, you model that uh, design. You run it through BeamConf or, or some beam convolution algorithm. You generate output maps. Uh, you compare the output maps to the input maps, and you iterate. You go back to the drawing board and you look at how you could have changed the design uh, to make the systematics less pronounced, right? So that's sort of a, the ambitious forward modeling loop. Uh, the slightly less ambitious uh, is maybe a little bit more realistic uh, modeling loop is. You know, we have ground-based experiments and, uh, you know, we'll model uh, the optical response of those ground-based experiments. And we'll see uh, in, our, in our data, maybe something that looks interesting. We'll make uh, minor tweaks to our instruments and uh, uh, use this, this uh, simulation structure to predict the expected improvement uh, in, in our data. So that's sort of uh, maybe more realistic, certainly for experiments that have already been designed or, and are currently being uh, built. So uh, we're actually working on an extension to this, uh, this code, um, as publicly available code. We've actually, if you go to the GitHub repository, you won't see uh, a whole lot of movement on the code, but we're actually working on, on private branches of the code that we're going to make public in the coming weeks. Again, this is work led by Ade Daufenhuden, uh, but now with a significant uh, contribution from uh, uh, PhD students at University of Stockholm, Alexander Adler and Nadia Dachlitra, and uh, PhD student at the University of Bologna, Matteo Billy. And now we're actually trying to account for uh, these polarization modulators. So what we in the CMB business call halfway plates, uh, at least in, in most cases. And so now, um, you know, upcoming CMB experiments, uh, a, lot, a lot of them will actually deploy these halfway plates in order to improve uh, the, the cross-linking and basically the polarization coverage that they, that they have and also help them uh, separate out uh, the signal from the atmosphere from uh, you know, the signal from uh, the CMB. And um, so these uh, polarization modulators are spinning. Uh, these are birefringent crystals uh, most uh, frequently uh, that are spinning on, on some kind of a bearing over here. And one thing that we haven't really been able to do up to this point is to simulate uh, the scanning of the sky when you account for uh, both, you know, the optics, uh, uh, you know, the lenses, and the polarization modulator. So now, with this improvement, we're actually um, sort of doing a beam convolution that actually accounts for, and this is where it gets very technical, uh, the Mueller matrix of the half -way plate. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about uh, 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 this picture in much detail. I'll just point out the fact that different uh, polarization modulators will have uh, Mueller matrix coefficients that vary with frequency. And when you deploy these polarization modulators, you really need to understand uh, you know, quite well the frequency variation in these Mueller matrix coefficients. And you have to model that uh, in, when you're doing your final data analysis. And so some of the upcoming results um, that uh, are going to be public um, tell us, among other things, that when we deploy these polarization modulators and when we want to really you know, get down to, let's say, the R of 0 0.003 level, so maybe an order of magnitude from where we are at the moment, uh, the 
the spectral energy distribution, so basically the spectrum of our foregrounds need to be uh, factored uh, and folded into our entire data analysis. Uh, and uh, in the spectrum of those foregrounds will actually interact with the halfway plate. And depending on the halfway plate they use, you'll get different types of systematics. And so it gets very rich and interesting and, uh, and, and complicated. So uh, we'll talk about that in, in this upcoming paper, which will hopefully be public in, the, in a few weeks. So with that, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's been almost an hour since I started talking. So I will stop here and uh, just uh, leave you with these conclusions. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few questions. Uh, thanks very much for that very interesting talk. Um, so we have a few questions now in the chat. And since we're at the end, I'm just gonna ask people to unmute themselves um, to ask their own questions. So Adam, do you wanna start us off? Adam, we're not hearing you. Sorry about that, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, um, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I want to ask on slide 43, uh, I imagine it looks like you're only simulating from one receiver point. Do you need to yes. do separate simulations for each pixel or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, so this okay. is, this is, uh, this is a, a very simple case where you have a pixel at the center of the focal plane and you have, uh, 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 you know, so you have the cylindrical symmetry in your system. And I just did that in order to, uh, you know, make a very quick simulation. Uh, as soon as you move off axis, the, the symmetry is broken and, and these simulations start to get much more computationally intensive. You know, it's easy to do that in, in, for this particular simulation. Uh, so this, this is uh, the output at, I think, 150 gigahertz. Um, so I guess that's two millimeter wavelength uh, to give you an idea for the sort of the complexity. Uh, I could move my pixel here to the edge of the focal plane and run this simulation on a, a relatively, uh, you know, uh, beefy or uh, uh, expensive uh, desktop uh, in, in a few hours. So I could solve the system in a few hours. But if I move off axis in this system here uh, and want to try to solve this system, it would take me uh, days. Um, That's for... Millions per pixel, pixels, per pixel, yeah. And uh, keep in mind that these these experiments, uh, uh, you know, the, the focal planes will deploy uh, uh, a few thousand pixels. So uh, it's going to be computationally challenging to simulate all of them. Well, I suppose there's some way you can model just the effect of shifting a little bit. Yeah. So so definitely we'll try. You know, we're we're definitely looking into ways to uh, um, sort of. Uh, just use the overall variation as we move across the focal plane and, and some, some sort of fancy interpolation routines to to account for uh, for that, so to save time. Yeah. The yeah. other question I had uh, in the chat was, uh, how do you take into account the numerical errors from your EM simulation itself when you want to apply this these beam models to the data? Or is that factored out in the iteration with the forward modeling? Um, so numerical errors. Um, so we, we, we look for the impact of numerical errors by basically increasing the, the meshing. So the resolution of our, our system and, and rerunning the simulation and seeing to what extent the, the final answer changed. And then you know, we, can, we can run two simulations and scan the sky with the outputs of those two uh, results and see if, if we actually care about the difference. And so that's sort of what we do in order to uh, uh, test whether we care about increasing our numerical accuracy. Um, does that does that answer your, your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next question. Hannah, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, first, I really enjoyed your talk. And my question was for your, on the slide with your simulation pipeline or Flow chart. <laughs> flow chart. Um, yep. It at at any oh, point do you do you add foregrounds to the input maps, okay. or is that just not something yeah, you're interested yeah. in looking yeah, at? Absolutely, absolutely. So okay. um, yeah, yeah. So um, in fact, what you're looking at in in this beautiful picture uh, are, are uh, foreground maps. Uh, actually, various types of foreground maps: dust and synchrotron and, and uh, CO. 
And uh, so we can actually, we can scan over all of them. It doesn't really matter uh, what the input map uh, is. Uh, effectively, what, what we're doing is we're, we're using the uh, spherical harmonic decomposition of the input map. So we're using these ALM coefficients to, uh, to scan the sky. Uh, and looks like my mouse just froze. Oh, there it is back. So, you know, we, we can, uh, you know, oh, it's freezing again. Um, so we can, uh, we can put in a CMB map, we can put in a dust map, it doesn't really matter. Um, does that, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, and, and, and effectively, you know, we can put them all together and run a scan over, over those uh, in one go, or we can simulate them all separately. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Hmm. Depending on what we're we're looking after, looking at. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe piggyback on that question. I'm curious about extragalactic point sources, and so it seems like the assumption here is that uh, holes in the maps have already been removed in some uh, way. Right. And yeah. So so this is uh, this um, this way of of uh, using uh, doing a convolution using spherical harmonics uh, is that you there's basically uh, it's, it's, there's a limit, right? We set some multiple limit that we care about, right? So uh, for example, if you're a CMB experiment focusing on primordial B modes and degree, polar, degree scale polarization, you know, your L max, the multiple number that you, you, where you start or stop caring to some extent is maybe L of 500, in which case point sources, um, you know, don't really matter that much. It's, it's hard to, to capture them. Uh, with modes that only go up to L of 500. So everything uh, higher than that will just not be, will be ignored in, in, our, in our simulation. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I thought I saw a hand come and go, but I, I didn't catch whose it was, but we, we do have time for a couple more questions. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I, mine's kind of up and down and frozen, but. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, hi, John. Thanks. I, I, I really enjoyed this talk as well. Um, Thank you. So I, I think, so you've convinced me that uh, the computation required to actually fully simulate the pixels and the asymmetry across the entire focal plane is inconceivable. So I'm not going to get a full uh, beam model just from calculations uh, based on the instrument design. Um, you've also convinced me that the side lobes, due to all of the conventional choices that we make in uh, our instrument design, because they're mixing in these bright galaxies, no matter what our scan strategy is, the, the bright source in the galaxy is just going to totally screw us over, and and you know is brighter than brighter than a lot of the the models for the tensor to scalar ratios that we're going after. Um, so. <laughs> it, you know, the, the flowchart definitely, I, I see how the simulations lead to iteration in the design to improve right. the design, but it doesn't seem right. like you're suggesting that we can make the design fully just fix this, right? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you're, you're justified in, in your concerns, and, and I think it, uh, it's important that we in, in the CMP community are, are, are aware of the challenges that we're facing. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we're not going to be able to get this under control. Uh, you know, for pushing down uh, to very low tensor to scalar ratios. Um, I, I don't think that I have uh, the, um, the experience and the simulation, or we have the simulations in the bank in order to make that claim. Uh, I think I, it's fair to say, and, and what, you're, what you essentially uh, said that I convinced you of, that it's going to be very challenging. Uh, but is, that's, the, that's... Is, the path, is the path that you're suggesting forward that through the simulations, we can design an instrument that doesn't have these, uh, the, the imperfections that will be bad? Or are you suggesting that we need to uh, have a way of measuring the beam at least as well as you can simulate it? I, I'm suggesting both. I, I think it's, it's, it's um, you know, uh, uh, a Gaussian illumination of your aperture results in a Gaussian far field beam. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but uh, so basically the, how well you control the E field at your aperture in the time reverse sense uh, dictates how low your side lobes are. And uh, you know, there are, uh, 
ways that we can do in instrument design or methods that we can use in instrument design to really uh, make this uh, aperture illumination as Gaussian and symmetric as possible. And we need to explore those uh, approaches. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're already in, in, the, in this field uh, starting to apply models that correct our data uh, so that we can set limits on, on tensor to scalar ratio. And the, um, you know those models are relatively simple. They they basically assume an elliptical Gaussian beam. Um, uh, here I'm referring to the bicep two and the CAT collaboration results. Uh, we there's no nothing preventing us from going uh, a step further and expanding those models into uh, models that that uh, assume uh, something for the side lobes, for example. And I'm saying that we need to extend those models in that direction. Um, and uh, obviously, we also have to measure the, the, the as-built optical response. And that's something that I didn't have time to um, uh, make slides for, which was to talk about how we actually do those measurements, whether it's based on uh, point sources uh, like, uh, like the planets or using uh, calibration hardware uh, before we or you know, here, on, here on the ground. Um, so so there, you know, we, we have ways to map out the beam response. Um, and uh, we, we will have to make use of those methods. So John, if, if, um, if you were able to perfectly map them for each detector, or if you were able to perfectly simulate them for each detector, so if you could just throw, throw Joshua's uh, concerns out the window and get perfect measurements for each, mm -hmm. um, in terms of analysis, the computer power to use different beams for every one of those 15,000 pixels is uh, oh. harsh. And so at some level, there's, there's another constraint that says you wish that all pixels were seen in the same sky so that you could uh, combine yeah. your, your beam measurement power and, and simplify yeah. your, your analysis. That's something yeah. you didn't mention in terms of an optimization we can do for the instrument. Do you want to? Yeah. So, so um, I, um, right. Um, so there's a, a um, in this paper and in, in the monthly notices, there's um, a plot that shows sort of basically the com you know, computational uh, scaling and complexity of this uh, uh, beam convolution approach. And I'm going to maintain that um, we can, uh, especially with the availability of systems like NERSC, uh, we can actually simulate uh, the convolution uh, up to L max 500, L max 1000. Uh, for every single pixel on a 10,000 detector uh, experiment. The, the, uh, the thing, the bottleneck, and the thing that's really going to uh, prevent us from, uh, well, not prevent us, but make our lives very difficult is that, you know, when you're doing that convolution, you're having, you're using one beam, beam model, right? And, uh, and um, as Joshua, I think I uh, was pointing out that, you know, uh, creating a B model for every pixel, uh, a very advanced B model uh, using the optical simulations, that's that's a computational bottleneck that I'm worried we're not going to be able to overcome. So uh, uh, if we have measurements of our beam response and we have great uh, you know, beam maps of our of our telescopes, we can feed those beam maps into this beam convolver that, that Adri wrote and um, and we can actually simulate uh, what what uh, the impact on this uh, in our time streams. So the, the convolution operation, even though it is expensive for a, a degree scale polarization, it's not prohibitively expensive. And um, as, as a sort of, sort of a, a reference to that, I think we'll, see, we'll soon hear from um, the Beyond Planck collaboration, which is led by a, a, a group in, in the University of Oslo, Hans Christian Eriksson and Ingun Verhus. Uh, and, um, that collaboration is, is doing reanalysis of uh, the Planck LFI frequency channels. Um, I know that's it's not it's like of order 30 detectors, but they actually are using uh, models of the beam response and, 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 and using them and convolving the sky and sort of fitting for those as part of the, the overall data analysis. So they're actually fitting for the beam model at the same time as they're fitting for cosmological parameters. Uh, and so I think that that's in some sense the, the thing that we need to have, you know, need to think about in the future. We're going to have cosmological parameters at the same level as nuisance parameters for the beams. Great. Yeah. 
Okay, I think in the interest of time, we need to bring things to a close um, so that John can get to his next meeting. Um, but thanks again for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, th thank John, you so it was much great to have you with us here virtually. Yeah, thanks for all the wonderful questions. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have so many people that are interested in optical uh, systematics. <laughs> it's not everywhere that you get that. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, take care.